American people, Republicans in Congress plunged headfirst into the Trump shutdown. How'd we get here? Why is it that Republicans and President Trump are unwilling to do the jobs they were elected to do and reach an agreement to fund the military, critical programs for the middle class, address DACA, fund children's health, and take care of disaster aid? Over the last several months, Democrats have bent over backward to negotiate with the White House. Unfortunately, the President and Republican leaders in Congress are like Abbott and Costello. The congressional leaders tell me to negotiate with President Trump. President Trump tells me to figure it out with Republican leaders. Let me talk a little bit about what transpired in the negotiations. First, a little history. Last year, when President Trump ended the DACA program, we immediately began working on a solution that both sides could agree to. Leader Pelosi and I went to dinner with the President. We came away with an agreement to pursue a deal pursuing the DACA Act with border security. The President agreed. But that night and the next morning, the hard right came after him. Breitbart called him Amnesty Trump. Laura Ingraham even insisted he be impeached. By the weekend, he had backed off. Then Congress went to work in a bipartisan way. Senators Durbin and Graham and their four compatriots worked hard to deliver a bipartisan deal. Two weeks ago, the President had a meeting on national television for the world to see. He said he wanted four things protect the dreamers, secure the border, end what he calls chain migration, and end the diversity visa lottery. And then he said he'd sign what Congress would come up with. Well, the bipartisan gang of six delivered. When the president heard about the contours of the deal on the phone with Senator Durbin, he was thrilled. He invited Senators Durbin and Graham to the White House, but the hard right attacked again a meeting that could have ended in a bipartisan handshake, instead devolved into the one of the most infamous meetings <coughs> of his presidency. But still, we went back to work, <coughs> excuse me, have a cold. But still, we went back to work to strike a deal with the president. Yesterday, I talked to the president in the morning. We were not far apart on the issues. A deal to fund military, and critical programs for the middle class can be struck. We agreed to the contours of that deal. An immigration deal was in reached. We could address children's health insurance, other health issues, disaster aid. We went to the meeting and had a long and productive discussion. I told the President we Democrats were willing to fund the military at the highest levels in history far above even his budget request. I reluctantly put his wall request for the southern border on the table. It was his request. We left the meeting, having agreed to try for a short-term CR that would keep everyone at the negotiating table for a few more days. The President suggested, let's do it by Tuesday night. We said, great. Several hours later, he called back. He said, so I hear we have a three-week deal. I said, no, Mr. President, no one's even talked to me about a three-week deal. I heard that's the deal. I said, no one's talked to me. I called Leader Pelosi, no one had talked to her. Then a few hours later, they called back again. Well, we're gonna need this, 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 in addition, things, it was General Kelly, that they knew were far, far right and off the table. Now, the lunch that seemed so promising was quickly overtaken by hard right forces in the administration, even though we bent over backwards to meet the President's demands. Negotiating with this White House is like negotiating with Jell-O. It's next to impossible. As soon as you take one step forward, 
the hard right forces the president three steps back. Now, I want to say, I don't have the personal animus that a lot of my colleagues have towards the president. We're both blunt and direct. I agree with him vehemently on just about every issue, but at least we can talk to one another. But it's next to impossible to strike a deal with the president because he can't stick to the terms. I have found this out. Leader McConnell has found this out. Speaker Ryan has found this out. So here we are on the first anniversary of the president's inauguration, mired in the Trump shutdown. It doesn't have to be this way. We can get big things done. We can fund the military at the highest level ever. We can commit unprecedented resources to the fight against opioids, to our veterans, to pension plans that are drying up. We can protect our southern border and protect young Americans who were brought here as children. We can pass children's health insurance. And I've never seen something so cynical as Republicans pitting groups of children against each other. They hold up CHIP to hold other children, these time the DACA kids, hostage. That's a disgrace. That's not what America wants. We can also pass disaster aid, which Texas, California, Florida, and Puerto Rico want. <clears throat> we can do big, big things, but the president needs to step up and lead. The Republicans control the presidency, the Senate, the House. They know who's responsible. The American people know that the Republicans control the presidency, the Senate, and the House, and they know who's responsible. America knows this is the Trump shutdown. Only the president can end it. We Democrats are at the table. We're ready to negotiate. The president needs to pull up a chair to end this shutdown. Ready for your questions. King. Um, can you define what you mean by when you say you put the wall on the table? Yeah. The big, beautiful wall, the entire Okay. Thing? This was not my... I'm not going to get into the specific numbers, but I will tell you it was the president who suggested the number, and I said, let's put it on the table. How big was the number? Uh, Senator, you're in a shutdown naming rights contest with the president. And, uh, <laughs> on Twitter, he's leading uh, 10 to 1. <laughs> Can you put aside, though, these political triflings, uh, which we would expect in this kind of situation? Okay, I don't care. Yeah. Can you talk to him again, and do you feel, after what you said, can you believe, well, you feel you can believe what he would say? Well, look, this is the third or fourth time on this issue he's made some kind of commitment and then backed off because he's afraid of the right wing. Whether Stephen Miller does it, whether General Kelly doesn't steer him in the right direction and just lets it happen, I don't know. But it's getting very, very difficult. You know. My hope has always been that Senator McConnell and Leader Ryan would see, knowing what they know about the president, that they would step up to the plate themselves. But they're afraid to, too, I think, or at least reluctant to. I wouldn't characterize it as afraid. But they are reluctant. Leader McConnell has said publicly that he doesn't know what the president thinks and has told me repeatedly I should negotiate with Trump. Yes. We did not reach agreement. We came close to the parameters of an agreement. But that things are being, that seem to be settled. Many hear from General No, I, I heard from the pre The first call came from the president about the three, three uh, weeks, which was news to me. Is the president actually running the White House right now? Well, you'd have to ask people who know the White House better than me. All I know is it's next to impossible to negotiate when the position keeps changing and changing and changing. Yes. Second, when you sit with the president, this is the second or third time I've done this on an agreement, you can see he really wants to do it. But then, a few hours later, because of the right-wing pressure, he backs off. And what I'd like to know is who in the White House is a sort of 
moderating force who says, this is a good thing for you and the country and um, your party. Go for it. Don't let these people back you off. I don't see anyone in the White House doing that. Next. Yes. But by injecting this issue into a shutdown, do you run that risk? Do you run that, the risk of damaging Look. that popular support and the prospects of a microphone? Well, first of all, Dreamers, unlike other issues, has huge bipartisan support. It's not something, you know, it's not like 2013 where Ted Cruz had his own view, but it was partisan and not popular. This is very popular. But second, this is the first time we've had one party control all three parts of the government, and the American people know that it's their responsibility to reach out and compromise, to get things done. There's a lot of feeling in the country that the White House is incapable of really leading the country. And when something like this happens, it makes, it exacerbates that view. Leader, uh, if negotiating with the president is like negotiating with Jello, as you said, then how are you going to get it done? And well, are you willing to go back to the White House this week? Look, any time, I, I suggested last night on the floor and this morning on the floor, that the president called the four of us back today and try to get something done. It's still very, very hard, given the past history and what I've said, but you always got to be willing to try, and I am. Thank you. Last one. Last one, CNN back there. Yelling isn't going to get you called on. I think the American. And, and do you think that Republicans, if you hold out long enough, will say, okay, we'll take the Gang of Six deal and pass it? Look, there are various compromises being bandied about. They're bandied about with far more serious today than they were yesterday by the Republican side. And I'm always willing to listen to compromises out of how to get this done. But at this point, we feel very, very um, strongly about the issues, not just dreamers but opioids, pensions, not funding the military on a CR basis,